I'm Andrew Rogers. I work for an organization called the Enterprise Center. Um, we are a very, very small organization that is attempting to do some of the same things that uh, UI Labs and, and City Tech are doing here in, Ch or in Chicago. Um, very similar alignment, very similar origin story to some degree, I think, like how they sort of developed um, over time to meet the needs of the cities. Um, so I think part of my, uh, uh, like what I should talk about was shaped a little bit by uh, uh, Denise's, uh, you know, enthusiasm for infrastructure. So hopefully that's something you all care about. Um, if not, we'll have questions and you can ask whatever you want. So um, the Enterprise Center, uh, is a, a nonprofit that is tasked, uh, we're funded by the city actually, and, and we have some foundation funding, funding as well, but mostly by the city, um, to focus on these three sort of core initiatives. Um, innovation district development, which is sort of the standard economic development stuff uh, you would see in a, a city trying to develop an innovation economy. Um, research and applications development, which is the piece that I, I, I work on, and then digital equity, uh, which isn't really last, but there it is, is number three, sorry. Um, so for the infrastructure part, I'm gonna give you a brief history of the gig, because I assume that not everyone here is as enthusiastic about Chattanooga or knows Chattanooga's story. Um, but uh, this, this will get you caught up pretty quick. Um, in 2010, Chattanooga's municipal utility, uh, EPB, launched the gigabit fiber internet service to their entire service territory. So. Um, that's uh, a 600 square mile area, the entire community. It was not a staged rollout. It was fiber in front of every home uh, available immediately. Uh, the only places that kind of weren't available were like the, con the, the apartment buildings that had contracts in place with legacy providers, et cetera. So um, pretty unique uh, applications. The first gigabit network in the US and certainly continues to be, as far as I know, the only ubiquitous rollout like that. Uh, this still hasn't been met just because of uh, the, the normal like commercial models for, for paying for these infrastructure deployments aren't based on doing it for everyone. Um, so in 2012, this is kind of getting the history of the Enterprise Center, uh, community leaders uh, kind of got together and said, okay, we've got this cool asset, we've got this gigabit thing. Uh, we think it's like huge for the community, but we're really not sure how. We don't really know this like technology stuff. Um, what, what should we be doing as a city to really take advantage of this infrastructure investment? Um, and in 2013, we had a new mayor who was coming in looking for sort of the things, you know, his uh, you know, marquee initiatives. And he adopted the work of that uh, uh, community collaboration into one of his uh, kind of launching task force, the technology gig and entrepreneurship. Um, and, and that report sort of shaped the work of what the Enterprise Center became. So of those seven key, there were seven key initiatives that were uh, uh, sort of outlined in that report of things Chattanooga should be doing to take advantage of that infrastructure. Uh, number one was to establish an entity to go like manage the other six. Um, and that'll be a kind of a theme is like, to get a lot of this work done, you just need someone that is actually focused on doing it. Um, so the Enterprise Center was retooled from an, an existing uh, economic development organization and you know, focused on these specific technology-centric um, sort of future-looking uh, initiatives. In 2016, um, we had spent a couple of years kind of feeling out that space and moving the ball forward on some existing stuff uh, and really understanding the space better, learning about what other cities were doing like Chicago and um, uh, trying to think of, of all the leaders in that space that at the time. I mean, Austin was doing some cool smart city work at that, at that time. Uh, we'd had the uh, Code for America fellows in town, so we kind of got a feel for some of the open data stuff. We adopted an open data policy for the city during that time period. Um, but in 2016, we sort of, understanding the space a lot better, we, we launched with these three specific initiatives um, that kind of cover every, you know, the, the, the swath of what we wanted to focus on as an organization. And I'm here to mostly talk about the research and applications development uh, initiative because that's the part that I've been most involved in. So, uh, and then to kind of talk about that, I wanted to kind of catch you up on like what all the infrastructure has done because again, all this, this interest in the infrastructure. So uh, since 2010, it's 2018 now, it's been eight years, it's been in place. Like, is it still just like the same gigabit internet, et cetera? So not really. Um, 
already mostly covered this, but the thing, the key thing that changed was that the whole core of the network was upgraded to allow 10 gig symmetric service anywhere in that same service territory. So um, certainly there's not a lot of people taking advantage of that right now, but it is a key asset for certain businesses in the area. Um, we have it in our office just because, um, and uh, it's pretty nice, right? Like 10 gigs for Cat videos is pretty awesome. Um, and it's symmetrical, so that's kind of cool. 9,000 route miles of fiber, that's, that's not like, uh, if you see a measurement, sometimes those are like in miles of each strand of fiber, and this is actually route miles. So some of those are 144 count fibers, 288 count fibers, et cetera. Um, there's 170,000 total addresses in our community in that 600 square mile territory. Um, and of those 170,000, 91,000 are subscribing to some form of the municipal fiber service. Um, of that 91,000, 9,800 are subscribing to a gig or, or more uh, speed. Um, this is kind of the interesting part of this that gets lost on the tech side. So most people who think about this are like, oh yeah, great, broadband, great broadband, awesome. I, you know, more, more cat videos six screens worth of cat videos, this is great. But the reason why Chattanooga put that network in place was actually to, to power its smart grid. So um, the utility that did this, this work, their whole kind of idea was one of the a key economic uh, leverage point they saw for themselves in the community is if we can make the electrical grid more reliable, we can recruit better businesses, we can, you know, that, that's something that affects everyone um, is if your electricity is reliable. So the, the, one of the key uh, outcomes of this is that la in the 2016-17 fiscal year, they avoided 24 million outage minutes through the re automatic reconfiguration of the network using the fiber system. So the fiber allows the electric system to respond to trees on lines or uh, wrecks or, you know, and, and reroute power in milliseconds versus what normally would take a truck roll um, to address. Um, and so really the question is, so what do you do with that infrastructure? And that actually took us a while. That, that was kind of that, that two, to four, two, two, two to four years of, of figuring it out. So um, our, our research and applications development kind of focusing that particular uh, uh, initiative came out of sort of noticing this as we got into this space that, you know, research and academia are siloed. And um, I only heard one researcher really introduce themselves, and we've got a, 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 a fellow, a research fellow over here, but uh, I don't know if they would argue with that. I would argue. Um, I've spent a lot of time with researchers. So, <laughs> and, and also city agencies are pretty siloed. And, you know, maybe, you know, city governments are, relatively uh, you know, different levels of, of, of functionality, but this is a pretty standard rule that like, if you go talk to one agency, they really don't know about the initiatives the other agency is undertaking that they could benefit from each other. And that's where these organizations uh, like the Enterprise Center and, and City Tech can kind of help. Um, citizens obviously don't, A, are not, they don't live their lives in silos, and B, um, they don't care about the city silos. Like, they don't think about, man, the reason why, you know, the bus is unreliable is because the transportation department and the bus company don't work together. Like, they don't think about that. They just think like, crap, I need to move closer to wherever I'm working because this is not working out. Um, so, how do we address this? How do we address this like fundamental issue with large organizations um, that everyone tries to address in every space from you know, large corporations to the entities themselves, the universities, et cetera. Um, we just think it like, takes a lot of talking uh, and communication and relationship building. Um, but anyway, so we, we, had, we started this initiative um, with these sort of, of five goals, uh, which is sort of to, to focus on getting cutting edge research actually deployed where citizens were interacting with it and researchers were getting feedback from citizens on the usability, the feasibility of the technologies that were being developed. Um, 
we felt that by doing that, we could increase access to research funding for the researchers because we can show better outcomes from the research that is funded. Um, we wanted to foster a spirit of innovation within the government itself that they felt a, uh, empowered to reach out to the research community, reach out to the technology assets or resources in their community to address their challenges that were facing their citizens um, and not just feel like, oh, that's the way things always were. Um, Obviously, you know, to think beyond the lab for the research communities and to get, uh, you know, what's the end game here? So we've had a few projects where left to their, you know, to, their, to, to themselves, the researchers would have published a paper, shut down the project, and like, that would have been that. Um, and by really thinking about it in the front end as you're writing your proposals, et cetera, of like, how does this project turn into, turn into something sustainable that continues to impact citizens? Um, we're able to see a lot better outcomes um, and obviously make Chattanooga a better place to live, work, and play for everyone. Um, and that comes in you know, shaping some of these. So, uh, you know, this is using the assets we already have in our community, um, just like you would do, except maybe that last one. Um, but the rest of these I think you all have, and a lot more than Chattanooga does, obviously. Um, and, and remembering, I think this is one of the most important things that I've learned, uh, you know, or, or not learned, but it's been hammered home, is like every time you think of a big entity that isn't changing or isn't doing something that you think they should be doing or they could be doing better, there's always people behind that. And if you go build relationships with those people, you can have an impact. And I think that's like the biggest takeaway from any of this stuff is it's about the people, and it's about communication and building relationships. Um, and, and their experience is an asset. I think this is a big problem that we've, we've seen and had to help sort of um, do it, what I call impedance matching um, between researchers and, and, and city agencies is helping the researchers understand where the city agencies, like, it's always been that way. It's actually experience. You need to ask you know, the deeper questions that get to why it was always that way and not just assume that you can drop in, you know, parachute in a technology to solve a problem without understanding the space fully. Um, I think uh, uh, Denise mentioned this earlier. Chattanooga has a deep collaborative spirit. We were a um, pioneer in, in public-private partnerships in our redevelopment in the late uh, the late 80s, early 90s, uh, water, water, what we call our waterfront redevelopment. Um, it gets studied in various uh, graduate schools around the country for, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a case study for uh, how, how communities can work with the private, uh, private industry to, to really make a big change. Um, and so we've sort of built on that set of experiences um, to continue leveraging that spirit of, of collaboration and then you know, apply it to technology. Um, and I just have a few examples of like how that's worked for us, uh, how we've been able to do that, and, and what the difference in sort of what, what the, the you know, impact would have been versus what the impact was. So um, we worked with the University of Southern California several years ago to do this really uh, interesting, unique, innovative uh, 4K streaming from a microscope with a, like a cin actual cinema camera at very low latency. So kids in high school uh, classrooms had access to these research grade biologic microscopes and could you know, see the microbiome. They could actually record videos. So like their research projects became, instead of turning in like what they, their observations on their experiments, they actually turned in like a YouTube video of the little amoeba running around and all this, and they didn't, it was mostly focused on water quality. Um, and that was great. And like, the researcher was all about developing that technology and writing the paper about that technology, and that was basically it. But by getting high school students and leadership from the school district engaged, we were able to take that and sort of add a forcing function that turned it into something that we could replicate within our community, deploy, and now uh, this fall we'll launch with high school students running a virtual lab that other high schools in the school district can, can access over, over the gigabit network, which is just super cool. Um, 
this is, I'm just kind of making some of the points that I had in the list, sorry. Um, we did a pretty good job of, of going after NSF money in 2016. Um, we haven't had, unfortunately, we have a very small university, so we have sort of a low amount of uh, bandwidth of, of actual researchers. So we haven't sort of, uh, in 2017, we were a little less uh, aggressive. But um, one of the things I think that was a key outcome that sort of talking to NSF uh, directors about what was different about some of the Chattanooga projects was, uh, you know, within the first half of their funding, they were already demonstrating real progress and actual deployments in city streets um, at smart city conferences, uh, you know, across the country, um, which was a lot further along than a lot of research projects get in their first sort of first half. Um, I think this is another key thing that we've learned is sort of these collaborations and relationships. Uh, it's a lot easier to build those when the stakes are small. Um, if you sort of go out and you've not talked to any of these folks and you go try to launch a $200 million or billion dollar in a city like Chicago initiative around some sort of sensor platform or whatever, um, you're gonna have a bad time. So like start, start early and start small. Um, build the relationships, practice those relationships. It's, I, I think part of the role um, that, that our organizations play is these sort of weird out, outsiders from the city and from the, the major you know, academic institutions, research institutions, et cetera. Sort of like these marriage counselors, like, but with a lot more people than a normal marriage. Um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of reducing that friction and just the, when people talk past each other, sort of recognizing that and say, hey, look, like, you guys are on the same side. Just think about it a little more, hear what you're actually saying, that sort of thing, and just making those, those relationships work. Um, and again, that's easier when you're not doing it over $100 million. Um, this is just sort of a, a data point about the funding that we went after and, and from you all's perspective, especially say University of Chicago's perspective, that's not a big deal at all, but for Little Chattanooga and the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, which has 13,000 students and didn't have a research program four years ago, it's a huge deal. So, um, And again, reiterating that getting everybody engaged I think just has better outcomes. Um, I mentioned I was going to hammer this point home. Um, I think this is another key point. Like, you know, I don't know about y'all's personal lives, but like, relationships are hard. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so they're not any easier when we're talking about uh, these sorts of, you know, cross-sector collaborations, uh, you know, or multi-stakeholder uh, coalitions, as uh, uh, we call them. Um, and I think this is the key part, is like a lot of times we expect, especially as like a citizen who hasn't really engaged in this work, I know this was, I was guilty of this, um, you just expect that all these organizations should want to work together and make my life better every day and I shouldn't, like no one should have to think about that. But in reality, you really take someone with a dedicated focus. And we have a saying in Chattanooga, and I've been trying to nail it down. I try to attribute it to my boss, Ken Hayes, but he says I think it came before him, who knows. But um, it's very simple, it is not eloquent, but it's real. Um, and so this is sort of our mantra at the Enterprise Center. Um, we found these spaces that needed real uh, uh, progress in our community, and we're the ones waking up every day trying to make it happen. So. Thank you so much for listening to me, John Miller. Mm -hmm. And questions. How would we make this happen in Chicago? That is really, really hard. I think there's a lot of communities trying to figure that out. Um, uh, it was really interesting in March. I was at uh, Smart Cities Connect, which is a big Smart Cities conference that, that we attend every year. And it was the one that the, the interim mayor of San Francisco decided to announced that San Francisco was going to have broadband for all um, without really saying how that was going to happen. <laughs> and it's because it's really hard. And he was kind of just 
launching this rallying cry of like, hey, let's all get together and figure this out and, and build you know, the coalition that can go make this happen. And I think that that's what you need is sort of that top level leadership. I can tell you for Chattanooga, you had to unlock your phone again, sorry. For Chattanooga, uh, it, you know, as much as it, it sucks to say this about like, we all want to see like open collaborative decision making like pull through. But the reason why Chattanooga has the gig is like because one leader just sort of had this vision and went and did it and getting you know, and, and push the rest of the community to do that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a leader, I don't think. I think it just has to be, you know, you have to have enough. And I think one of the problems that I see doing it today versus uh, even the, you know, almost 10 years ago that we did it, when you look at like when we started building versus when we launched it, um, we're so, everyone is so much more aware of all of the challenges that are facing our cities and technology infrastructure while it's like there it's hard to like prioritize that over housing right like that's a really difficult thing to do um, and, and I think that the more you can do to tie that you know to build a future ready economy for everyone in your community you need equitable access and, open, and access for everyone everywhere, I think that's a really important point to make at this, at this point in history. I think you really have to, to not only like say that, you have to go show that and show how you can be impactful. So um, a lot of the work we do in digital equity now is just making sure that folks in our community are getting access to the connectivity and actually able to utilize it. Um, and it's really hard as, you know, pretty much a digital native, I think I would call myself. Like, it's really hard to fathom all the things we do in our daily lives that make our lives easier and cheaper. And we just only, like online banking, um, if you're in, uh, I, I like the uh, economically fragile, I like that actually a lot. If you're in an economically fragile environment and you're a single mother and you're working, you know, a job and, you know, having to take care of your kid, and then you need to pay your utility bill and you have to take a bus to the bank and then to the utility office, whereas we just like pull up our phone and pay the utility bill and we're done. Like we don't think about like paying bills. We think everybody can do that, but that they can't. If they've never been online and we've got people in our community that have never been online and I'm pretty sure that you've got people in your community that have never been online. Um, and so it, it takes a lot of just sort of stepping back, putting yourself in those shoes and then developing the programs that can make this asset useful for them. Because if you go try to sell putting this together to benefit the folks in this room or the folks that work at this company, I mean, if I'm a political leader at this point, I'm going to say, hey, I've got way worse problems to deal with than whether the folks at Braintree can like watch Netflix on four TVs at home. Um, but if you can really tie it to these equitable outcomes and the opportunity that this represents, I think that's where the potential for moving this forward in the, in the future. Awesome. So another question in the document, who does the fiber network peer with? Who, main, who operates the network and who maintains those peering relationships? So um, I don't know how much of this is uh, public, but it's going on YouTube now. So. <laughs> The peering is all, like, so EPB, which is the municipal utility, they operate the network. Um, they've maintained operation. They've done all the upgrades. They've built out new systems. They actually are so good at operating these municipal networks that they contract with other municipalities who are deploying these networks to help them design, build, and operate, and, and even support. Um, so they're, I mean, they're the real asset in our community that is driving all this. They're amazing. Um, the peering happens just like any ISP would peer. So it's, uh, we're fortunate in Chattanooga that we're a railroad town and a lot of the you know, um, high level uh, peering providers follow railroad routes. That was the original fiber, uh, a lot of the original fiber routes. So we have actually um, you know, several hundred gigs, I think, of, of peering between our municipal network and the commercial internet at large. Um, and those look like standard 95th percentile build peering agreements that you would operate for any large commercial internet entity. 
Hi there. Um, given that your organization is a nonprofit, I suspect that you guys often run into like bureaucracy. So how do you guys work uh, through those issues so that you guys can actually accomplish the issues of like cross sector like accomplishment? I mean, I'd say that's like, that's all we do is run into bureaucracy. I mean, that's like kind of our job. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't want to represent that like any of the great stuff in Chattanooga, I think we're very careful to say that, that we don't, the only, about the only space we take direct action in is really some of the digital equity work and the innovation district, district work. In this sort of very weird, broad, ephemeral like space, our goal is to make the folks who want to do good work successful, um, whether they're at the university, whether they're a city, you know, city employee, um, and, and help them cut through that bureaucracy. So sometimes that means that like, you're having a meeting with the mayor to discuss something that is some, you know, someone who actually works for the mayor, or someone who works for you know, one of the agencies below the mayor is championing. Uh, we like, we, that's another sort of uh, uh, Chattanooga truism is, you know, if something doesn't have a champion, it's kind of the same thing just flipped around. If something doesn't have a champion, it's probably not gonna happen and it's probably not worth us like investing a bunch of time in because if we're not gonna carry it forward and there's not anybody else that's gonna carry it forward, then, you know, it, it's just, you gotta have somebody. So we do a lot of work of like finding those champions who wanna do something really, that would be really great for the community and helping them get access to the resources and the decision makers that can make that happen. Just uh, like a quick glance at Chicago. What do you think is a sweet spot opportunity out here? Sweet spot offered in, in which, in the connectivity and smart cities and- You know, completely open-ended. Oh man. Is this one of those things where like opportunity is a problem or? Because <laughs> it seems like, um, you know, community policing and public safety is like a big thing that, Ch that Chicago needs to address. I mean, that's sort of the, the 50,000 foot view of Chicago right now. Um, we have some of those same issues. Uh, we are, uh, you know, it, we're going through, we've, we've gone through, we had a really great police chief and then he retired and hired another really great police chief. And they're both really dedicated to community policing and it's really seeing outcomes, um, but it's hard work and it's slow and you don't immediately see some of the, but um, that's certainly, I'm sorry, I just can't quit hitting buttons. Um, that's certainly something that I see from like a distance. Um, yeah, you know, I like Chicago a lot. I like coming up here. I mean, it's it's a great town. So uh, obviously, you're you know the having the University of Chicago here is a huge asset, and so the 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 uh, open uh, or uh, open data fellowship. Uh, what's the fellowship program that operates? Data science for social good. Yes, great program. Those sort of like I, I see Chicago leading sort of this open data space, which is really difficult for us. Like. The fact that you have 100 people here uh, for the, that Chai Hack Night is amazing. I mean, this is really awesome. Y'all are an awesome community. I would kill to have this in Chattanooga. Um, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, that's a really hard question. Um, other than like going to the biggest problem that I associate with Chicago, I really don't know how to answer that. No, it's no, it's all right. You just need you know, not to overthink it. Just kind of you're out here visiting. You're so focused on it in Chattanooga, which is so different than in Chicago. Maybe there's some inspiration. If I was in Chicago, I'd want to look into that more. See if that's a good way to go. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously connectivity uh, is a challenge. I think that's something to to focus on. I think we have. I think uh, I don't know where Chicago is on like. 5G and small cells right now, but that's a big opportunity to not let carriers screw over your constituents. Um, so <laughs> maybe that won't go on YouTube. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think those are, that's an opportunity, like if you, if you can be one of the first big cities to really deliver a deployment of 5G and small cells that addresses your citizens equitably, 
that would be huge. Um, and maybe you don't need all the fiber deployment that Chattanooga has. Maybe you can accomplish that with some wireless technologies. But making sure that happens equitably is going to be a really hard task for most cities. Uh, what is the relationship between your organization and the Chicago Gigabit Challenge, such as Gigabit Squared One funding for? It could be just be a yes or no, or none. None that I'm aware of. Right, that uh, it was that, is that Gigabit Challenge? Yeah, I'm not aware. Is that, was that associated with Mozilla? Gigabit Challenge communities? No? No. No, okay. <laughs> Fair. So how did this come about in terms of, like, I think of telecommunications companies getting in the way of having equitable access to high-speed internet. And so, you know, with a city like Chicago, where each of the neighborhoods, the myriad of neighborhoods are so ingrained in which internet is provided, how how was that, I know obviously Chattanooga is substantially smaller than Chicago, but they're, they're still a player, that Comcast and all of the other, big, how did you get around that issue? So I, I mean, I think, and this is kind of the, the why, like another reason why it would be really hard to do what we did in, in Ch Chattanooga and Chicago is, is, I would call it the sneak attack. Like we were one of the first, so they didn't see it coming. And there had been municipal broadband uh, organizations and entities before that, and a lot of them had failed. A lot of them were really bad models that just didn't work out. Like they either tried to offer connectivity too cheap, couldn't meet the quality of service that the commercial entities had, um, there's a lot of horror stories that uh, you know, Comcast uses in every state to lobby and lobby and lobby to prevent other communities from doing what Chattanooga did. We certainly, like, we got the tail end of that, or, or they came at us on the tail end once they realized it was gaining traction and sued the city of Chattanooga to prevent them from building a, a broadband network. Uh, and, and basically where that's at right now, policy-wise, is the state of, of Tennessee uh, passed a uh, policy that says that the city of Chattanooga cannot deliver service outside of the existing electrical service territory. So that 600 square miles, I think one of the, one of the things that I probably didn't, didn't kind of uh, make as a point was that of that 600 square miles, um, you know, a lot of it, I mean, there's, there's a good bit of dense urban area, but a lot of it is like really, really sparse rural, uh, you know, and, and to have like, to be able to get 10 gig service at your farmhouse at the end of like, you know, a, a three mile drive with no other, no other houses on it, like that's kind of this really crazy thing. Um, but to be able to like, if you're just across the county line from there, you can't, you know, you, you might can get dial up I mean, there's some places within an hour drive of Chattanooga where dial-up is still the only option, and kids, you know, parents take their kids in at night to the church down the street from them to do homework on the Wi-Fi because they can't get access at home, and that's like that's just a reality. So um, there's been, you know, a lot of our the communities around Chattanooga are fighting really hard to get access to advanced broadband, but. Uh, that, that is a reality, like the, the carriers do fight it. Um, I think having a model like Chattanooga you can point to that's been financially successful. I, I think another point I should have made that uh, I probably didn't was that the fiber network actually makes money for the utility. So the utility turns around and actually uh, we're in a very regulated utility market um, through, uh, we have what's called TVA, it's a federal entity that does all the transmission and generation for our area. Uh, and so they like to prescribe, this is what the rate for utilities will be, this is how much you're going to pay. And EPB was able to avoid three years worth of rate hikes by taking money from the fiber and reappropriating it to the uh, energy side. So that affected, I mean, arguably it still affected folks who were paying huge utility bills because they had huge houses more, but it did affect equitably even folks who didn't have access to the fiber and their utility bills stayed the same. So. Thank you.